I made a previous video on methanol and I've commented on it in other videos and for those I looked at books, articles and videos about distillation and how to manage the problem. I ended up towing the party line that methanol is potentially dangerous and we need to be careful in order to avoid poisoning. But this idea does not stand up to scrutiny. Theory gives only limited help. Most relevant data that we have on distillation are on binary systems, that is, systems with two chemicals like ethanol and water, ethanol and methanol, or methanol and water. The reality is more like a ternary system with three chemicals. These are more difficult to plot on graphs because of the three variables. Also, because of the multiple number of combinations, they generally haven't been investigated with the same resolution, and in particular, there are few data on the behaviour of the ternary ethanol-methanol water system with methanol concentrations under about 1% in the public domain. A ternary system approximates binary systems when one of the three components is dominant which water is in wash, and ethanol is in azeotropic spirit. If we look at the binary methanol water phase diagram and magnify the lower left-hand corner for low concentrations of methanol, things look quite encouraging. With a 1% methanol concentration in the liquid phase, the vapour phase contains 7 to 8% methanol, 7 to 8 times as much, and that makes it look as though methanol will be concentrated early in the run and later the concentrations will fall because there will be little left in the liquid phase. However, if we turn now to the binary ethanol water phase diagram, the same is true of ethanol. Wash at the beginning of a batch run will typically be about 10% ethanol. With that liquid phase there will be about 60% in the vapour phase, or 6 times as much. Magnifying the bottom left corner shows that when the wash ethanol concentration falls to 1%, there'll be about 17% in the vapour phase, or 17 times as much. That means while the four shots methanol to water concentration may look encouraging, the methanol to ethanol concentration does not. And the ratio of methanol to ethanol in the four shots will be similar to the ratio in the wash, and it looks as though the ratio will not change much into the hearts. Finally, the binary ethanol-methanol phase diagram is relevant to the separation of heads at the top of the fractional distillation column, where the azeotropic ethanol and water mixture behaves similarly to ethanol. Here, aside from the diagonal, there are two additional lines because two experimental data sets have been plotted on the same graph. Magnifying the lower left-hand corner, the scale of this plot does not allow us to look at 1% methanol in ethanol, but the lines are straight, so the proportionality will hold. We can see that at 5% methanol in ethanol in the liquid phase, the vapour phase only contains about 7.5% methanol, so a slight increase, but not at all impressive. Overall, the theory gives us mixed messages. At the beginning of the run, the methanol is quite keen to come out of the liquid phase, but ethanol is almost as keen. As the run progresses, ethanol overtakes methanol in its keenness to come into the vapour phase, as both become depleted from wash. And at the top of a fractional distillation column, methanol is only slightly keener to stay as vapour than is ethanol. Let's turn to actual experimental results of batch distillation runs using a pot still. Methanol concentration is usually measured with gas chromatography, which is an offline technique. Other methods are in development that may be more accessible to home distillers, but at the moment it's not easy to measure the methanol profile of a distillation run. Some scientific papers have done this. This graph is taken from Namina Spaho's book chapter referenced here. It shows the analysis of five samples taken at regular intervals throughout a pot still distillation run, in this case of plum brandy, which is quite high in methanol. The red line shows the declining alcohol content as the run progresses. The rest of the graph is a histogram showing the concentrations of groups of congeners. Esters, acids, higher alcohols or fusel oils as they are also called, methanol and acetaldehyde. The methanol content of the distillate rises rather than falls throughout the distillation run. These graphs come from Pino's paper referenced here. 
The paper is about a novel technique for methanol measurement that's more portable than the cumbersome gas chromatography. The left graph shows the methanol as measured by their new device, and the right one shows it as measured by gas chromatography from the same samples, which were taken throughout batch distillation runs from washes based on plum, apple, cherry and herb. Herb refers to a mixture of industrial ethanol and herb rather than fermented wash, and it was intended as a control. You can see that in no case is there a dramatic fall-off in methanol concentration as the run progresses, apart from at the end in the tail section. The plum and apple cases show an initially high methanol, then a fall, a rise and a longer fall. These graphs show methanol concentration in the distillate as the run progresses, but ethanol concentration falls during that time. What's more relevant is the ratio between methanol and ethanol, which Pino also gives us in his paper and is shown here for the four types of wash. The legal limits given for methanol in drink are those of the European Union and vary with the alcohol content. They are in grams of methanol per 100 litres or hectolitres of ethanol. 1,000 grams per hectolitre is equal to 10 grams of methanol per litre of ethanol. These graphs show the reverse of the moonshiner's narrative. The most dangerous cuts for methanol exposure are not four shots and heads, but rather the last half of hearts and tails. The message is clear. The moonshine narrative about four shots is false. They do not contain significantly more methanol than any other part of the run, and throwing them away does not eliminate methanol from the distillate. Commercial distillers know this. They do not throw away four shots because they know that to do so makes no difference to the methanol content of the product. They know that cuts are taken to control taste, and they recycle four shots with heads and everything else. There is a final and more compelling argument against the methanol narrative. Safety engineering has one major research substrate. It is not engineers getting cleverer at anticipating things that might go wrong, but rather it is the investigation of adverse events and applying the lessons learned to future engineering. That's how safety works. Air travel is so safe now because for more than a century air accidents have been carefully investigated with one objective, avoiding recurrence. The substrate for safety of home distillation is investigation into past adverse events. Again, the methanol narrative comes unstuck. From the scientific literature, methanol poisoning has a fairly short history. The earliest reports are a couple dating from the last half of the 19th century, when it was produced by distillation from wood. Around 1890, a method of production from methane was developed, which allowed it to be made cheaply in large quantities. It entered industrial use and methanol poisoning took off. Ziegler reported in 1910 that many wines, brandies and whiskies sold on New York's east side contained 24-43% to 43 methanol. It was not until it was shown in 1923 that a group of Hamburg dock workers had been poisoned by pure methanol that its toxicity was established, but it was still being questioned as late as 1936. In one outbreak, during five days in October 1951, 323 patients presented with methanol poisoning in Atlanta, Georgia. There were 41 deaths. 90 gallons of illicit whiskey containing methanol had been distributed in the city 24 hours prior to the first patient's presentation. Analysis of confiscated samples revealed 35-40% to 40 methanol by weight and less than 4% ethanol. It was one of the largest outbreaks and occurred sufficiently late that it was thoroughly investigated and gave us some of our best data on the clinical effects of methanol poisoning. The authors reported that of all of the 115 patients who were acidotic when first admitted had some form of visual disturbance in the acute phase. Most of them fully recovered though. There are many other reports of outbreaks of methanol poisoning and they continue to occur. Authors don't always give details of the origins of the methanol because quite often it's not known. But large outbreaks provoke strenuous investigation and these are invariably associated with the adulteration of drinks usually deliberately, rather than from careless distillation. Similarly, there have been a number of surveys of available drinks, 
and where quality control is poor, they find up to about 2% methanol content, with occasional instances much higher. Again, authors may not know the origin of the high methanol content, and so don't report it. As far as I know, after searching the literature, there are multiple cases of reported methanol poisoning. Many of these are caused by mixing drinks with industrial methanol, usually deliberately. In other instances, the cause for the contamination is not known, but in no case that I'm aware of has it been found to be caused by careless distillation only. Many YouTubers say, including myself in the past, that fermenting fruit wash with naturally occurring organisms, including both bacteria and yeast, can produce a high methanol content, which is true, but it doesn't usually bust about 2% from reported cases, whereas significant toxicity requires a higher percentage than that. Actually, the toxic range of methanol isn't that well defined and there may be highly susceptible individuals. There is, for example, one case report of somebody who became blind after drinking only 4 millilitres of methanol, although there's significant suspicion that the real dose was a lot higher. The upshot is that we cannot say that methanol from distillation is not a safety issue at all. But we can say that it's a theoretical rather than a clearly demonstrated risk. There are other risks from moonshine consumption that are clearly demonstrated, specifically heavy metal poisoning from lead-containing equipment and various sporadic cases where moonshine gets contaminated with other poisons. But that's characteristic of a covert or unregulated industry, rather than being anything specific to distillation. So there is a question over whether methanol toxicity is a real issue at all in home distillation. It looks doubtful, but I cannot say clearly that it's a falsehood. What is clearly a falsehood is the idea that discarding four shots deals with the problem. This raises the question why this misunderstanding is so pervasive in distillation circles. I think there are four reasons. The first is that qualitatively it is true that methanol concentration in the first part of a distillation run can be somewhat higher than at later points in the run. It's only when you go into quantitative analysis that the differences in concentrations can be seen to contradict the narrative. The second reason is psychological. Methanol is toxic, it can cause death, and rather horrifyingly, it can cause blindness. That, coupled with the qualitative fact that there can be more methanol in the foreshots, makes us want to be careful, and it gives us this easy way out by throwing away the foreshots. The third reason for the prevalence of this false belief is that there are several published reports of serious outbreaks of methanol poisoning associated with alcohol production, particularly spirit production in an uncontrolled environment, giving the same anti-methanol soundbite. But going into the details, we find that it's actually contamination for nefarious reasons, usually to cut a more expensive alcohol with a cheaper methanol-containing product in ignorance or despite of the toxicity. The final reason is that, from the point of view of governments who don't want uncontrolled alcohol production because of tax revenue loss, there's not much incentive to disabuse the notion that home distillation is dangerous. In the past, when the relationship between methanol toxicity and distillation wasn't so well known, particularly in America, it does seem that methanol toxicity was used as a propaganda argument against moonshining. More recently, though, I do not find evidence of governments using this argument in propaganda. If it were true that there was a significant risk and cases of blindness kept occurring, governments would take a more vigorous approach to policing and preventing moonshine production. It is currently legal in many places in the Western world, and even where it's not legal, governments don't seem to make preventing it a high priority. No doubt they would if it was really that dangerous. The bottom line is that the story about methanol circulating amongst home distillers is false. I am not without guilt. If you look at my previous video, which I will not take down, you will see that I propagated the same falsehood myself. At the time I believed it, which is why I am referring to it as a falsehood, rather than a lie. Methanol is not really an issue. It may contribute to hangovers from apple and pear or plum-based spirits, but it is not present in significant amounts from grass-based spirits like grains and sugars. I do not drink four shots or heads. That used to be because I didn't want to go blind. However, now that I've found it's not a risk, I still don't do it because they taste bad. I don't throw them out as most home distillers do. They still contain quite a lot of ethanol, so I just add them back to the next run.